excerpts from the Fox's Book of Martyrs. This is from the Martyrs of Scotland. There was a certain act of Parliament made in the government of the Lord Hamilton, Earl of Arran, giving privilege to all men of the realm of Scotland to read the scriptures in their mother tongue, secluding, nevertheless, all reasoning, conference, convocation of people to hear the scriptures read or expounded, which liberty of private reading lacked not its own fruits, so that in sundry parts of Scotland were opened the eyes of the elect of God to see the truth and to hate papistical abominations among whom were certain persons in St. John's town. So they were allowed to read, but they were not allowed to gather together to hear the scriptures or to hear them explained. Now at this time, there was a sermon made by Friar Spence in St. John's town, otherwise called Perth, affirming prayer made to saints to be so necessary, that without it there could be no hope of salvation to man. This blasphemous doctrine, a Burgess of the said town called Robert Land, could not abide, but accused him, in open audience, of erroneous doctrine, and adjured him, in God's name, to utter the truth. This, the friar, being stricken with fear, promised to do, but the troubled tumult and stir of the people increased so that the friar, he could have no audience. At this time, A.D. 1543, the enemies of the truth procured John Charterhouse, who favored the truth, and was provost of the said city and town of Perth, to be deposed from his office by the said governor's authority, and a papist called Master Alexander Marbeck to be chosen in his room, that they might bring the more easily their wicked and ungodly enterprise to an end. On St. Paul's Day came to St. John's town the governor, the cardinal, and the earl of Argyle, with certain other of the nobility. And although there were many accursed for the crime of heresy, as they term it, yet these persons only were apprehended. Robert Lamb, William Anderson, James Hunter, James Ravelson, James Finlayson, and Helen Sturk, his wife. They were cast at night in the Spey Tower. Upon the morrow, when they were caged, they were brought forth to judgment. They were laid to their charge, the violating of the Act of Parliament before expressed, and their conference and assemblies in hearing and expounding the scriptures against the tenor of the act. Robert Land, he was accused, in special, for interrupting the friar in the pulpit, which he not only confessed, but also affirmed constantly that it was the duty of no man who understood and knew the truth to hear the same impunged without contradiction, and therefore sundry who were there present in judgment, who hid the knowledge of the truth, should bear the burden in God's presence for consenting to it. The said Robert also, with William Anderson and James Ravelson, they were accused for hanging up the image of St. Francis in a cord, nailing of ram's horns to his head, and a cow's rump to his tail, and for eating of a goose on all hollow even. James Hunter, being a simple man without learning, and a flesher by occupation, so that he could not be charged with no great knowledge and doctrine, yet because he often used that suspected company of the rest, he was accused. The woman, Helen Strike, she was accused, for that in her childbed she was not accustomed to call upon the name of the Virgin Mary, being exhorted thereto by her neighbors, but only upon God, for Jesus Christ's sake. And because she said that if she herself had been in the time of the Virgin Mary, God might have looked to her humility and base estate 
as he did to the virgins, in making her the mother of Christ, thereby meaning that there was no merits in the virgin, which procured her that honor to be made of the mother of Christ and to be preferred before other women, but that only God's free mercy exalted her to that its, its state, which words were counted most execrable in the face of the clergy and of the whole multitude. James Ravelson, aforesaid, building a house set upon the round of the four stair and the three crown diadem of Peter carved of tree, with the cardinal took he as being done in mockage of his cardinal's hat. After sentence was given, their hands were bound, and the men they were cruelly treated, which things the woman, beholding, desired likewise to be bound by the sergeants with her husband for Christ's sake. There was a great intercession made by the town for the life of these persons to the governor, who of himself was willing that they might be delivered. But he was so subject to the appetite of the cruel priests that he could not do anything that he wanted. Yea, they menaced to assist his enemies and to overthrow him, except he assisted in their cruelty. The martyrs were carried by a great band of armed men, for they feared rebellion in the town, except they had with them men of war, to the place of execution, which was common to all thieves, and that make their cause appear more odious to the people. Every one comforting another, and assuring themselves that they should sup together in the kingdom of heaven that night, they commended themselves to God, and died constantly in the Lord. The woman desired earnestly to die with her husband, but she was not suffered. Yet, following him to the place of execution, she gave him comfort, exhorting him to perseverance and patience for Christ's sake, and parting from him with the kiss, said, Husband, rejoice! We've lived together many joyful days, but this day in which we must die ought to be the most joyful unto us both, because we must have joy forever. Therefore I will not bid you good night, for we shall suddenly meet with joy in the kingdom of heaven. The woman, after that, was taken to a place to be drowned, and albeit she had a child sucking on her breast, yet this moved nothing from the unmerciful hearts of the enemies. So after she had commended her children to the neighbors in the town, for God's sake, and this nursing infant was given to the nurse, she sealed up the truth with her death. With most tender affection consider, gentle reader, the uncharitable manner of the accusation of Master George Wishart, made by the bloody enemies of Christ's faith. Ponder the furious rage and tragical cruelty of the malignant church in persecuting this blessed man of God, and on the contrary, his humble, patient, and most godly answer, made to them without any fear, not having respect to their boastful menacings and boisterous threats, but charitably and without stop of tongue answering, not changing his visage. I thought it not impertinent, somewhat to touch concerning the life and conversation of this godly man. According as of late, it came to my hands, certified in writing, by a certain scholar of his named Emery Tilney, whose words here follow. About the year of our Lord, 1543, there was in the University of Cambridge one Master George Wishart, commonly called Master George of Bennett's College, a man of tall stature, pole-headed, and on the same a round French cap of the best, judged to be of melancholy complexion by his sigomony, black-haired, long-bearded, 
handsome of person, well spoken after his country of Scotland, courteous, humble, lovely, glad to teach, desirous to learn, and well traveled, having on him for his clothing a frieze gown to the shoes, a black million fustian doublet, and plain black hosen, coarse new canvas for his shoes, and white falling bands and cuffs at his hands. He was a modest man, temperate, fearing God, hating covetousness, for his charity had never end, night, noon, nor day. He refused one meal in three, one day in four for the most, except something to comfort nature. He lay hard upon a puff of straw, and coarse new canvas sheets, which, when he changed, he gave them away. He had commonly by his bedside a tub of water, in the which his people, being in bed, the candle put out, and all quiet, he used to bathe himself. He loved me tenderly, and I him. He taught with great modesty and gravity, so that some of his people thought him severe, and would have killed him. But the Lord was his defense, and he, after due correction for their malice, by good exhortation amended them and went his way. Oh, that the Lord had left him to me, his poor boy, that he might have finished that he had begun. For he went to Scotland with diverse of the nobility that came for a treaty to King Henry. If I should declare his love to me and all men, his charity to the poor in giving, relieving, caring, helping, providing, yea, infinitely studying how to do good unto all and hurt to none, I should sooner want words than just cause to commend him. To the said Master George, being in captivity in the castle of St. Andrews, the dean of the same town was sent by the commandment of the cardinal and by his wicked counsel, and there summoned the said Master George, that he should, upon the morning following, appear before the judge, then and there, to give account for his seditious and heretical doctrine. On the next morning, the Lord Cardinal caused his servants to address themselves in their most warlike array with jack, napskull, splint, spear, axe, more seeming for the war than for the preaching of the true word of God. And when these armed champions, marching in a warlike order, had conveyed the bishops into the abbey church, incontinently they sent for Master George, who was conveyed unto the said church by the captain of the castle, accompanied with a hundred men, addressed in the manner aforesaid, like a lamb, they led him to the sacrifice. As he entered in at the abbey church door, there was a poor man lying, vexed with great infirmities, asking of him alms, to whom he flung his purse. And when he came before the Lord Cardinal, the sub-prior of the abbey, called Dane John Wyrim, he stood up in the pulpit and made a sermon to all the congregation there assembled. And when he had ended his sermon, they caused Master George to ascend into the pulpit and there to hear his accusation. And right against him stood up one of the fed flock, a monster, John Lander, laden full of cursings, written in paper, the which he took out a roll long and full of threats, maledictions, and words of devilish spite and malice, saying to the innocent Master George so many cruel and abominable words, and hitting him so spitefully with the Pope's thunder the ignorant people dreaded, lest the earth would have swallowed him up quick. Notwithstanding, Master George stood still with great patience, hearing their sayings, not once moving or changing his countenance, when that this fed sow had read all this lying menacings, 
his face running down with sweat and frothing at the mouth like a boar, his spit at Master George's face, saying, What answerest thou of these sayings, thou runagate, traitor, thief, which we have duly proved by sufficient witness against thee? Master George, hearing this, kneeled down upon his knees in the pulpit, and when he had ended his prayer, sweetly and Christianly, he answered to them all in this manner. It is just and reasonable that your discretions should know what my words and doctrine are, and what I have ever taught, that I perish not unjustly to the great peril of your souls, wherefore, both for the glory and honor of God, your own health and safeguards of my life, I beg your discretions to hear me, and in the meantime I shall recite my doctrine without any color. Suddenly, with a high voice, cried the accuser, the fed sow, Thou heretic, runagate, traitor, and thief! It's not lawful for you to preach! Thou hast taken the power at thine own hands without any authority from the church. Then all of the congregation and the prelates with their accomplices said, If we give him license to preach, he's so crafty and in the Holy Scriptures so experienced that he will persuade the people to his opinion and raise them up against us. Master George, seeing their malicious intent, appealed from the Lord Cardinal to the Lord Governor as to an indifferent and equal judge, to whom the accuser, John Lander, with hoggish voice answered, Is not my Lord Cardinal the second person within this realm? Chancellor of Scotland, Archbishop of St. Andrews, Bishop of Meropis, Commendator of Ambarnsock, Legatus Natus, Legatus A. Later, and so, reciting as many titles of his unworthy honors as would have laudan the ship much sooner an ass, is not he, quoth John Lander, an equal judge, apparently, unto thee? Whom other do thou desire to be thy judge? To whom this humble man answered, saying, I refuse not, my lord cardinal but as desire the word of God to be my judge, and the temporal estate with some of your lordships, mine auditors, because I am here my lord governor's prisoner. Hereupon the prideful and scornful people mocked him, and without all delay they would have given sentence upon Master George had not certain men counseled the cardinal to read again the articles and to hear his answers thereupon, that the people might not complain of his wrongful condemnation. They caused the common people to void away, whose desire was always to hear the innocent man speak. Then the sons of darkness pronounced their sentence definitive, not having respect to the judgment of God. And when all this was done and said, the cardinal he caused his tormentors to pass again with the meek lamb into the castle until such a time as the fire was made ready. And when he was come to the castle, there came Friar Scott and his mate, saying, Sir, ye must make your confession unto us. He answered and said, I will make no confession unto you. When the fire was made ready and the gallows the Lord Cardinal, dreading that Master George should have been taken away by his friends, commanded to bend all the ordnance of the castle to prevent that part, and commanded all his gunners to stand beside their guns unto such time as he was burned. All this being done, they bound Master George's hands behind his back and led him forth with their soldiers to the place of that wicked execution. As he came forth of the castle's gate, there met him certain beggars asking of him alms for God's sake, to whom he answered, I want my hands, wherewith I should give you alms. But the merciful Lord of his 
benignity and abundance of grace that feedeth all men, vouchsafe to give you necessities, both unto your bodies and souls. Then afterward met him two friars, saying, Master George, pray to Our Lady that she may be the mediator for you to her son, to whom he answered humbly, Cease tempt me not, my brethren. After this he was led to the fire, with a rope around his neck and a chain of iron about his middle. And when he came to the fire, he sat down upon his knees, and rose again, and thrice he said these words, O thou Savior of the world, have mercy on me, Father of heaven. I commend my spirit into thy holy hands. And when he had made this prayer, he turned to the people and said, For the word's sake and true evangel, which was given to me by the grace of God, I suffer this day by men not sorrowfully, but with a glad heart and mind. For this cause I was sent, that I should suffer this fire for Christ's sake. Consider and behold my visage. You shall not see me change my color. This grim fire I do not fear. I know surely that my soul today will sup with my Savior Christ. The hangman that was his tormentor sat down upon his knees and said, Sir, I pray you forgive me. I am not guilty of your death. To whom he answered, Come here to me. When that he came to him, he kissed his cheek and said, Look, here is a sign that I forgive you. My heart, do your office. And then he was put upon the giblet and hanged and burned to powder. When the people that beheld the great tormenting, they might not withhold from piteous mourning and complaining of the innocent lamb's slaughter.